All right. As you can see, it's never too early to drink in Germany. We're really excited to have you guys here. Thank you for coming, audience. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, let's take a look at our next, next best of five at that bracket. Go ahead and tug it up there. It's going to be Stardust against Vortex. This should be a fantastic PVZ. Stardust, a uh, DreamHack champion uh, coming here in the ESL. I know he's, had, he's also had a tough run, or not ESL, excuse me, WCS. He's had a tough run as well, kind of like Genius, or not Genius, but Duck Duck before him. And now here he is established as well. So it should be really good. And Vortex, one of the Duran Duran brothers, trying to make a stand here as well. Yeah, this is actually going to be a really good series, I think. Because uh, Stardust is known for being a Korean killer. I mean, he started that name beating the likes of Violet, Jadong, all those guys at DreamHack when he first won his big tournament. Uh, and since then, he's always been known for his aggressive play style, which I'm pretty sure we're going to see today. But Vortex, on the other hand, is pegged by a lot of other professional players in the European scene as a secret favorite to win the entire thing because he is really playing some of the best StarCraft we've ever seen from him. So like Grubby and I said before, this should be another really close series. We're looking forward to it. We put together a video to talk about each of these players. The first one up is Stardust. My name is Sun Sok I am from South Siberia. What? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Sun Sok I am from South Korea. Now I am living in Switzerland. And then I'm 23 years old. Oh, he's actually just going to go for a oh, trade here, kill off every town. If oh. he kills off the anti-air, all oh, the Banshee actually goes down, though. I want to not lose, not losing. Just some people think I want to win, but I want to not lose because that means win. But sometimes tie, like play. <laughs> but, so I don't want to lose losing, so I just play very safety, sometimes cheating. I have many think about the prize money, but most important thing is my family. So I want to using a lot of money for my family and then some money for my life. Oh. He's getting zealous on his third base now. There's going to be a couple of EMPs from the high ground here to maybe save us something, but he doesn't even try it. GG Stars turns it around. I want to say always very thank you and then Please keep cheering for all of the player, yeah, especially me. Stardust. Yeah, sure. That guy has a really special personality. He's a fantastic player to back it up. I'm happy that they showed so many of the games from his series against Happy. You guys commentated it, but that was one of the closest matches I think I've ever seen. That's the only tie that's ever happened in the World Championship Series, right? It was a remarkable game, but what a brilliant interview. I really like that one. He always does. I, I, I also host for DreamHack, and, and there's a couple times where it's really hard because sometimes you ask questions that are maybe a little bit awkward, maybe a little bit lame, and they just kind of go, narrow, narrow, and then they look at you like, <laughs> oh, like you don't know what to say, but Stardust always has something really cool, funny, and, and oftentimes uh, informative to say. So that was Stardust. His opponent is going to be a Spaniard. It's one of the brothers. It is Vortex. I'm Juan Moreno Duran. Better known as Vortex, a Starcraft 2 player from Team Mouse Sports. I'm 20 years old and I play Starcraft. Those well, Zealots don't want to be uh, out there in the open and they will absolutely get destroyed. Hammered down and here comes the army. Two swap grades not even completed yet, but Ultra is chewing away onto these armies. All the units that Protoss have are plus three, but the sheer amount of units, the quality that they are, are going to be too good. And Vortex will pick up map number one here against Baby Knight. Well, I have like a very big family. Like uh, we are three brothers and you know, we were like very competitive between us, like we would play anything like chess or um, whatever, every game you can imagine of. I kind of got into Warcraft 3 because uh, my eldest brother had played a bit. And you know, I remembered when I was little, I watched some games and I thought, oh, it was a funny game. So yeah, when I quit World of Warcraft, me and my brother Lucifer started playing Warcraft 3. And that's how I got into pro gaming, you know, I started playing tournaments in Spain and from there I started to go better and better. Oh, the puck is gone. Ooh, that's bad. That's really bad. That Marauder falls very, very quickly. As do the Marines. There's really not that many units out here for Thorzen. Vortex, there you go. Yeah. GG. My brother was like two years older than me. And then when I was like, oh, I probably will never be as good as him. I was like, hey, I'm two years behind. So, you know, it did never stop me. Actually, it was like a motivation to see that he was doing very good. 
And I was like, I can do it too. The Bailey's break the oh. bunker and Vortex is in. Really good control by Vortex. He pulled those back. There you go, GG. I'm a very impatient player. Like I always try to attack all the time and it's not that I don't feel confident in, in long games, but I don't know why I'm, I've always been impatient in my life and I try to go for the kill all the time. So yeah, I think that's the biggest trait in my gameplay. All right, and there you have it. It's going to be Stardust versus Vortex. I'm going to start us off by putting you right on the line. You're, you're, you're a pretty smart guy. People think you're one of the smartest commentators, whatever that means, if you know what I mean. Uh, give us a little bit of a breakdown. Who's favored here and, and by how much? Who do you think? Uh, I, I mean, these two players, they're, they're so good, especially within their respective matchups they're playing. They're so equal, especially when you look, you know, look at the ranking system as well. But I have to favor the, the Spaniard here. And the reason for that is because Stardust started and has really had a good 2013. He hit it hard when he won DreamHack Summer. But, you know, he's been very consistent, but his style is out there. Everybody knows how he plays. Vortex is smart. Vortex is going to approach this series with one mindset, scout what he's doing, defend it, and get in a good position. And that kind of style and mindset coming into this series, it, it clearly is going to favor Vortex. Yeah, absolutely. Vortex does have the advantage of knowing that he's probably, I mean, he calls himself a cheesy player, does Stardust, but it's, it's we commentators call yeah. it aggressive. He's an aggressive, <laughs> uh, micro-oriented player. Um, I actually asked Vortex before the series what he thought about playing Stardust, and I asked if he's played against him any number of times. And he said that, of course, he's hit him a few times in the ladder, but one thing he's noticed about Stardust is that what Stardust does kind of outside of a tournament, what he does inside of a tournament, mm. to your point, it's similar, but it usually has a little bit of a different flavor. So. Every time I see this guy, Stardust, enter into a tournament, I have to wonder, what does he have prepared? I mean, a lot of people are very quick. I know that Nurcio kind of was famous for saying to him, like, all you do is 8-gate, you know, why do you even play? But it, he puts his own little flavor on it going to tournaments. We saw those Immortal All-Ins, those double forge play that he did against Jadong at DreamHack. It's, it's kind of tough to prepare for. So even though we know his style and Vortex will as well, what specifics are we going to see from him, right? Which is uh, the big, big point. And that's why scouting and information is going to be crucial for Vortex in this series. So Vortex is going to have to get that information, but ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and introduce those commentators for today's series. It's going to be Colaris and Grubby. Thanks very much, guys. Welcome to the caster's desk with myself and Mr. Grubby. How are you doing so far, man? I'm doing great. How are you? Not too bad. We had a quick series, but now I'm anticipating a little longer one here between Vortex and Stardust. Again, uh, I said at the previous one, I can't call it either way, uh, and it kind of went a very, very strong way. Uh, but this one, I, again, can't really call too easily. And we don't have to. The players will call it for us. They've got a lot of stuff prepared here. They're thinking about their map videos right now. Uh, maybe they planned it out before. Maybe they're doing it on the spot. Can I wait and see what maps they're going to be removing? Just one for each, of course, because mm -hmm. yep. it is a best of five. Although you wouldn't say it from the first series length. No, that was uh, pretty rapid. Uh, <laughs> we weren't expecting it to be that quick. Back long ways goes away first for Vortex. Doesn't want to allow uh, his opponent Stardust to go into, you know, a bit of a longer game, a bit safer. And then Polar Knight is removed from Stardust. I'm really not too surprised by that veto, actually. Hmm. Yeah, it's uh, probably the two most standard removals for each race. Zerg, I don't think they even need to think about it. Echelon Lace, bye. Yeah. It's <laughs> the most removed map for Zerg in Season 3 of uh, Europe. For Zergs. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's because that's interesting, actually, that you mentioned that because in terms of map popularity, you see a lot of Akalon wastes. Yeah. But just not from Zerg. Not from <laughs> Zerg. <laughs> They're like, mm, Zerg's they not know. welcome here. No. <laughs> it's, uh, They're invited. But they don't want to come. No, they, they got don't. other engagements. They they do. They they would rather be elsewhere. They'd yeah. rather be Belcher Vestige. The parties over there. Oh yeah. Or even I heard Frost. a lot about Belcher Vestige parties. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. yeah. Frost. Mm, I don't know. Little chilly reception. Oh, <laughs> I knew you were gonna do that somehow. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, best of five now it goes between these two guys, and these guys, in my opinion, have very clashing styles. They've already spoken about it, Jeff and uh, Sean, as to what we see from Stardust. But a player here in the form of Vortex, he likes to be able to, you know, go very upgrade lust, get a nice big army, maybe hold on for a bit, depending on what his opponent's doing, and react to, to his opponent's stance there. Yeah, and and. Let's talk a little bit about Vortex's style. Do mm -hmm. you see Vortex as an aggressive player or a defensive player in the ZVP matchup? 
It's interesting because I, I I see him as an aggressive player when he wants to be. I know this is like the cop-out answer, but it's because he <laughs> reacts so well to what his opponent's doing. It's like yeah. if a two bases come in, all right, he will sit back and just chill out. But if he sees that his opponent's trying to get that third base, it's all guns ho to try and deny it and do some damage there. Yeah, I agree with that. I'm a little bit divided on Vortex too because I, basically he is an aggressive player. Mm. Back in Wings of Liberty, when everyone was massing up Infestors and Broodlords, the Slifko style, at least here in Europe, was defend, defend, defense, spine crawl, spore, yeah, yeah. get 30 broodlords. Vortex was the guy that also, of course, used the best composition of investors and broodlords. But as soon as he had eight broodlords, he attacked. Mm. And that set him so far apart from uh, most of the other protagonists so of the Zerg race. And it, I mean, if you do that with Infestor Broodlord, which is best camping, then if you have Roaches and Hydras, of course, you're also going to attack with that. Yeah. But then you've got the other side. He is very good at defending all ends. He, he really is. And we saw that in the round of 16. We saw that. Uh, but now we do have our second player in this series, Stardust. Oh. Those win ratios are pretty good. And uh, in comparison to a player like Genius, who has a very small sample size of games, Stardust, across all of the dream hacks he's been attending, has been just dominating every single performance there. And those, those uh, win ratios certainly reflect that. Yeah, and, and he's kind of like holy trifecta of Protoss. He, he started in Korea with Brood War, then he switched to StarCraft II, mm -hmm. moved to US for a while, and now he's living in Europe. So if we're talking about fusion and cooking, I would say he's a fusion Protoss in StarCraft II yeah. playing. <laughs> he knows all the different styles, and he uh, has both very good mechanics, and he's very creative. He, he really is. Our first map here will be Derelict Watcher. This, in my opinion, is a little bit of a tough one to see Stardust start on. Uh, Vortex is very, very well versed on this map. Not only going through the mid game with, you know, something like he can play both styles. He can go, you know, the Roach Hydra with range style, but he can also, something that he does like on this map, going for the Zergling heavy melee style and then eventually switching into Ultralisks. Of course, though, if he can survive what his opponent's predicting to throw at him. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And uh, surviving can be pretty easy for Zerg on three bases, mm -hmm. but as soon as they have to uh, get out there on the map and uh, get to the fourth base, it can get a little bit more difficult because the fourth base is further away, so a good harassment and multitasking by Protoss can make it difficult for the Zerg. But the Protoss' problems, they come a little so uh, sooner. The third base can be a bit difficult, but it really depends a lot on the styles. Yeah, and uh, again, Vortex has been changing things up quite a lot uh, during this season alone, never mind other seasons. Interestingly enough, currently Vortex is the only player to not drop a single map in series in season three here of WCS Europe, which is a very impressive run when you consider the players he's been going up against uh, in the form of, in the round of 16, Baby Knight and Thorzane. So, but Stardust, he'll be his tallest challenge yet, certainly. Yeah, definitely. Now, I was saying last uh, last week, Vortex didn't have anyone who seriously challenged him yet. Mm. Those statistics, of course, they're one thing, but also, like, none of these games were difficult. I think now it'll be difficult. Yeah. yeah. This <laughs> is the challenge. This is the challenge. Can Vortex rise to it? As we have Vortex and Stardust facing off in a second best of five of today. And oh boy, is it going to be a good one. As we have spawning down to the bottom left-hand corner, our Red Zerg representing Maus and Spain. Give it up for Vortex. <laughs> And up to the top right-hand corner here are Blue Protoss, representing my insanity as well as Korea. Give it up for Stardust. Yeah. There was a really excited yelp there from someone. <laughs> that was pretty cool. <laughs> I feel that excited too, but it wouldn't be professional if I let out a yelp like that now. Probably not, no. But sorry. I want to. You want no, to? No, I want to. Oh, okay. right. Abstain. So, <laughs> the first decisions have been made by both players. Mm -hmm. And for Vortex, it's a decision not to go for a 6 or a 10 pool. <laughs> and for Stardust, it's going to be very likely a gateway expansion. I like the option of a gateway expansion here because Vortex is the kind of guy that, as you just previously mentioned, can sometimes go for earlier pulls just to be like, well, you know, I'm going to throw this in and see how you're going to react to it. Uh, and if that were to occur, gateway opening, not too bad against that. Yeah. Uh, Vortex did do a little bit of that 10 pool, 10 gas build before, yeah. where you get very early speed upgrade for your Zerglings. It finishes just before the five minute mark, and you try to swarm the opponent with lots of Zerglings. But it's a risky build, and he doesn't. you don't generally want to start off with that in the first game, because uh, everyone is still very awake 
They're very alert. Mm. Uh, people are going to be scouting. They're going to be, you know, seeing what you're doing. They want to get a feel of what you're doing. So, make sure your status is not scouting yet and not building anything at the ramp. So, that could be a potent strategy against him this game. But how would Vortex mm. have known? Yeah, indeed. Uh, Stardust is just playing his own little game in his own little corner of the world. Yeah. Uh, having seen nothing from Vortex thus far. Meanwhile, Vortex, he's playing his own game as well. Sending out that Overlord, which is obviously so normal uh, to see what eventually is going on. And he'll spot it in just a little bit and be fine. <laughs> yeah. All right, so Hatchery first for Vortex into gas. And... Oh no, sorry, it's a spawning pool first. Yeah, spawning pool with a hatchery yeah. and gas. So what Vortex is going to be doing is he's played a safe style, went for a spawning pool early. He's going to get maybe two to four Zerklings out and he's going to get an early speed link. So that means that his third base won't be quite as early. That's going to br basically bring rise to any number of possibilities for him. He can go for a very Zerkling heavy, two mm -hmm. base style, go to lair even on two base, or he can take a roughly a six minute and 15 seconds third base. So for Stardust, there isn't as much pressure to do an early aggression on Vortex. And he's going to see that probably pretty soon with the probe. So he will start to formulate his plan. Is he going to get a third Nexus, Stargate, Twilight Council, Robo? We're going to have to wait and see. Um, Stardust has a lot of options available to him. Uh, normally, he would be the aggressor, but still there is the option to go for macro properly if he wants to. We've seen Stardust do, uh, play a few macro games out and uh, perform very well, but it's really that aggression that shines through for him. And Vortex is going to be looking for that. A lot of looking for that. Uh, normally, we see Vortex's overlords get in there just the right time once Tech goes down. He knows the timings. And the Stargate's already on the way, and the overlord is already on route to spot it. Yeah, and of course, Stardust is completely okay with that. When you're building yeah. a Stargate in the wall, you can't <laughs> say, I'm going to make a plan to it's protect hidden. this from being <laughs> scouted. <laughs> I hope you don't scout the front of my base, which leads to every other path in my base. No, <laughs> it's going to get spotted. It got spotted, and he saw actually a Stargate and a Forge. So it's not the three gateway with a Stargate or the other way around, a Stargate and then plus two gates. It's with a Forge. So what that means is that the only thing Vortex needs to worry about for the next two minutes is just getting spore crawlers in about a minute or so. Yeah. He doesn't need to worry about zealot pressure, so he can make a lot of drones, get some spore crawlers, get some queens, and just uh, yeah, follow his plan. He's not going to be under any threat, so he's going to play, I think, very comfortably. Yeah, exactly. And you know, with that third base going down, he's feeling a little bit more comfortable. And I feel that, you know, going into this series for Stardust, as much as Stardust normally is known as the aggressor, I actually think that he feels this game out and tries to play a macro game. Because uh, doing anything else, uh, you know, Vortex will be anticipating something like that. But at the same time, can he go into a macro game against Vortex? Because Vortex is a scary guy. And these Zerglings. Well, one oh. sneaks through. <laughs> and the sentry will barely survive. Ooh, that was close. He built that, that gateway there. A little bit of uh, scared position there for Stardust. Yeah, and it looks like Vortex just makes 8 to 10 links just to make him use that force field, which means uh, less force field uh, a little bit later. And also, uh, no hallucinations count. But we've got Phoenix coming out here. And I think you're right. I think Stardust is starting with a Phoenix build in game one so that he can get a feel for what his opponent is playing. Because mm. Imagine, you go very extremely in one direction, you're doing this build, and suddenly you realize, hey, actually your daily shape, not very good. Yeah. Why, why did I give you so much time? Exactly. So he, mm. he's kind of trying to feel out Vortex's daily shape right now. And it's got to be mentioned, that little circling pressure, I think Stardust messed up his macro during that. He had a very big probe cut because he was supply blocked mm. for 25 seconds. That's a bit brutal there at the earlier stages. That spot crawler is in range of the Phoenix, so Vortex covering himself well, but Stardust trying to find little holes where he can. Only one drone died so far, but there was also an Overlord killed uh, during all of that. I think he's killed a few more units in total. So he's, he's sitting around 750 resources lost and killing a few more as well. So Stardust not doing too badly with this, catching all those transferring drones. Huh? Really nice. Yeah, but I do have to think of legendary German player Mondragon mm. uh, comes from Brood War, played a bit of StarCraft 2, his counter sheet against Phoenixes. Drones, hatcheries, queens, and roaches. Yeah. <laughs> so <he> just <laughs> only drones and queens and hatches, and then eventually roaches. Even though they can't shoot up, it doesn't seem to make sense. But when you make enough stuff, you can afford to lose 10 drones. You just made 20 to 30 drones anyway. Uh, nice. Big nostalgia hit, man. That was uh, TSL <laughs> from a long time ago. Good stuff. Yeah.
Anyway, 64 workers, 248 right now, with Vortex still in the lead, catching some more of those transferring workers, uh, but can't really do too much. And now the unit production begins here for Vortex. And yeah. how well can Stardust deal with that second Stargate already going down here for him? Now, he's still making Phoenixes. He went up to seven already, and he's made a second Stargate. He's not going to keep making double Stargate Phoenixes, right? I think he's going to switch to Void Race. If he did keep making Phoenix, it would be very Munzik style. Oh, he wow. is going to. Wow. We've seen this in the... If he went for a third Stargate, then I would... The alarm bells would certainly be ringing there because this can actually hold up a lot. He is. He's just continuing Phoenix production. Yep, and he has that twi uh, temple, uh, the Twilight Council finish. So he's going to be adding either Archons or Charge or both. I'll be very surprised if he makes Blink. Blink's yeah, talking to Phoenixes. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what are you doing, man? This is a little bit of a variation from what we saw in the past from Myungsik, so I don't want to say that it's exactly the same. Uh, Myungsik went for a very fast three Nexus off of one gate and then added three Stargate. Yeah, there was that. And then, you know, with that, obviously there's the opportunity to pick up a lot of this. I mean, he's already doing quite a good job with these. Force fielding that out. Now these roaches really can't do too much. He sees the second Stargate, though. He gets information about what kind of what his opponent's doing. The roaches are continuing to try and break through. And this is this is kind of like the Mon Dragon style yeah. of, like, you've got a lot of Phoenix, you don't have enough to pick anything up, and now my roaches, you have no gateway units to kill this off. Oh my god, and he ran out of energy. Uh-oh. He can kill one roach every five seconds, but that's about it. And I think there's he a has, lot more than one roach here. He has no energy. No energy left on these Phoenix. The roaches are absolutely running amok. The Zealots are coming back to deal with this, and slowly he's picking these roaches off, but they're doing so much damage in the process. Yeah, now they're starting to kill probes. Now the damage is starting to get significant, and he's gonna run in there. Meantime, he's saving up Hydralis. He's making a nice creep path towards the middle of the oh. map, and every probe kill is gonna be very, very important here. All of these roaches are gonna die. But they're gonna get so many probes. Exactly. So many probes. 12, 13 have already gone down. The Zealots coming back to try and clean this up as well. But taking that big a hit to your economy when your opponent's on 73 drones against 42, that's big. And roaches are almost free when you have that many uh, drones. Like, they are meant to die. You don't want to go into the late game 200 supply of roaches. You want to use them for something. <laughs> and it's okay to have them not be cost efficient purely by cost because you have a better income. And Vortex might end up just going full out balls to the wall Hydras. So yeah. He's going to mix some Zerglings in as well here against these Zealots. Did they, did they get plus one in the end? Let's see, his upgrades. They did, yeah. So there is that out for Stardust. But this follow-up attack, how do you deal with this with Phoenix? Sure, against Hydras in small numbers, these Phoenix would be great. But they're going to disintegrate very quickly. He's going to pick up a lot, or try to at least. I think this might be a little bit of a mistake by Vortex to go this soon. I would have liked to see him wait a little bit longer. He just killed a lot of workers, mm. so the advantage that he would have in a minute would be bigger than it is right now. There's a small chance that he loses them all. He's got seven Zealots out and 14 Phoenix to deal with 25 mm, yeah, Hydras okay. now knocking on his third base. Okay, okay, okay. So Charge is on the way. The third base is going to go down. Vortex with a very strong move towards this location with Zerglings reinforcing and the Spire going down behind this. This is looking bad for Stardust. Yeah, actually Vortex judged the situation very well, even though he doesn't have full vision. This was not a mistake at all. It's a very good move. <laughs> and yeah, he has way too much, actually. And I'm just going to just engage here as those Phoenix do try and pick up what they can, but at the same time, they are dying off quite quickly as well. Even the Zerglings holding the Zealots at bay because it's just not enough here for Stardust. And Vortex in game number one is actually just going to crush through this play. GG. Yeah. Vortex looking strong in game number one, but at the same time, we have to go back to what Stardust did that wasn't that common a build. Yeah, and he made the... Twilight Council, but it literally made no difference except the cost that he spent on it. Yeah. <laughs> His charge was 80% done at the end of the game. He didn't have plus two, he didn't start the Templar Archives or Dark Shrine, so that part didn't help. And you could say that Vortex just attacked him too soon. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's, uh... Uh. yeah, well, there you go. That's Stardust for you. <laughs> I hope maybe he heard me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, you know, he looks back on that game and he's like, nah, that yeah. was that was a bit strange. But, and I think now this is where in game number two, he kind of goes back to a bit more of his norm. It's possible. Yeah, because uh, this build is something that we haven't seen yet from Stardust. Yeah. So this was meant to be a build that surprises and maybe gets an advantage and maybe counters something that Vortex was known to be doing. But... That's two points for Vortex. Not only did he take that game, but he took it against something that he hadn't necessarily seen before or had mm. been expecting. Yeah, now Stardust might be going back, as you said, to his comfort zone. We're going to have to wait and see.
That was a hard map, though, for Stardust. So maybe yeah. he just said, this might work if this, 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 and this happens. But now that it hasn't, that's OK. I got my second map coming up. Yeah, it's like you, you feel that you're at a disadvantage on the map. Instead of going for what would be your standard aggression, you try something a little bit wacky, a little bit out of the norm. Take the risk yeah, and see yeah. if it works. Do you remember, uh, well, I think everyone remembers, like there's this player in StarCraft 2 called Parting. Oh, yeah, that guy. Maybe some people know him. He had this build. Uh, I guess he still has it. An immortal in you make three sentries, uh, three immortals, about eight to 12 sentries, and you just attack the Zerg at around the 10 minute mark. Mm -hmm. And he, ha he was doing it so well that he was winning game after game after game with it in Wings of Liberty and as well in the current expansion set, uh, Heart of the Swarm. And he had like an immaculate record with it. Now, you could imagine that if you mm. were to play it on a map where it's not good, that he doesn't do it. He didn't do it all the time. No. Almost. But <laughs> Almost. you could imagine that you would like to keep a 100% win rate, never play it in unfavorable conditions, mm -hmm. so that the opponent builds up the strategy in their head. They can really say, this strategy never lost. They've never seen any evidence to the contrary. So in this way, you can keep your best builds scary. Is that what Stardust was doing now? Don't do it on this map, because yeah, to be honest, this map not going to be as good for force fields uh, force field based yeah. strategies because it's so open. Exactly. So maybe Stardust said, I want to keep my best strats really scary. And that those best strats could certainly come to play here on Yonsu, a map ah. where there is a lot of room for someone like Stardust to be aggressive. Very narrow paths, a lot of places to actually force field off. The third base, if you attack from the low ground, isn't necessarily the easiest thing to break as a Protoss. But if you attack from the high ground, you do have certain opportunities to actually pressure through uh, with good force field placement if Stardust wants to do something like that. So Vortex has got to be on his toes here in game number two. Yeah, definitely. Stardust planning his next move. There's a lot to think about. There All is. that practice over the last weeks, months that you've been doing is coming together in this one series. Lose it and you're out. Mm. And there's a lot on the line. For both of these players currently sitting at, uh, if you would talk about Stardust, currently 30th in WCS ranking, and then we have Vortex at 35th in WCS ah. ranking. So very, very close between these two. Uh, and if you do move on past this round, you get start gaining a lot of points. And then obviously you guarantee yourself at the finals, the yeah. uh, season three finals, which is big, big points which could propel you very, very far indeed. And it's going to be in Canada. Yeah. One of the few and first few eSports tournaments in Canada for mm -hmm. StarCraft 2. Very exciting. Uh, I bet these players would love to go there. All right. Well, speaking of exciting, let's get into game number two here between these two players. For, uh, Vortex currently one game up here against Stardust. In this best of five, of we have spawning up to the top right-hand corner, uh, Red Zerg, representing Maus as well as Spain. Give it up for Vortex. <laughs> Down to the bottom left-hand corner, our blue Protoss, representing my insanity as well as Korea. Give it up for MYI Stardust. I'm Geordie all of a sudden. What? Why I? Never mind. It's an English thing. Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I have a lot to learn about English slang. Uh, uh. It's it's all our accents. There's a lot of them across England, so yeah. maybe you don't want to learn about them. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so Yonsu, our map where we could see Stardust be very aggressive, but likewise Vortex, again, he's going to be looking out for it. Yeah. Definitely is. Now, interestingly, uh, Stardust. A lot of his builds that made him win that Dreamac that he did, mm -hmm. they were revolving around uh, Forge Fast Expand. Yes. So either a Nexus and then a Forge, or a Forge and then a Nexus. He comes into this with a whole new methodology. So it could be that he's trying to make Vortex uncomfortable. But of course, as a Zerg player who plays a lot of ladder, as Vortex does, he's going to meet any number of Gateway Expansion builds and Forge Fast Expansion builds. So if he didn't over-concentrate on what he thought, Stardust is going to do this one thing and this one thing only, then he's going to be quite all right. And so far, he looks quite all right. And Control looking more handsome than version Leonardo DiCaprio. He's, he's certainly rocking it and today. And more buff. Yeah, more buff as well. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a scary thought, actually. In control, he's he's a big fella. He's in control he's DiCaprio. Right. In control DiCaprio. Leonardo Di in control. Okay. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> he's gonna kill us later. <laughs> <laughs> Leonardo would never do that. Oh no no he wouldn't. He's a he's a tame fella. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> third base right. going down. B four spawning pool. O mm, vortex. Oh, you vortex. Oh. Uh, oh hello. A little bit of drone mess up there. That can 
really get into your head sometimes. Yes, it can. It's like, oh no, this is one of those games where my control isn't perfect. I just sent all my drones to one patch. It sucks. It's but, really annoying. Yeah, just try to shrug it off. Anyway, Vortex did this in game two against Wellmu, I want to say. Hmm. I think so. Yeah. He d in game yeah. one, he did a uh, normal build, pool hatch on Belcher Vestige. And then the yeah. second map on Derelict Watcher, he went triple hatch before pool, which Vortex doesn't do. No, Vortex, you don't do this build, but you're doing it again. And you know what's interesting about this is that Vortex, once he establishes himself on these three bases, if Stardust doesn't put on some early pressure for whatever reason, normally Vortex sits at a very, very strong economy once something like, for example, a two-base play would come along from a player like Stardust. So yeah. it gives him a strong, strong wealth of shutting something like that down, and I think Vortex has actually played this out quite smartly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, the way that he doesn't do it in the first map, so that once again, exactly. the opponent doesn't know are you that kind of guy mm. who takes really illicit advantages and then but then I can't do anything against it so I guess it is legit because really there's no downside to opening like this if the opponent doesn't proxy gate or cannon rush you yeah it's certainly a tough one and now that probe sees that this hatchery is finished uh, at this particular moment in time and starts zapping away at it in annoyance that probe He's trying to do what he can. Second probe being sent out. That is interesting. Oh, he's going to go for a quick third Nexus. Wow. Uh, very quick. Very, very, very quick. This is a new reaction uh -oh. from Protoss players across the board. But the Overlord's going to see it very that, quickly. It's may, Maybe it's OK. I don't, I don't know if it's going to be OK, This, this is going to be difficult, because if speed finishes and he just made a big round of Zerglings yeah. now, surely couldn't he just kind of attack it? I think so. <laughs> and there's no Forge. Yeah. There we go with the Forge. It's going to finish in 45 seconds. Uh, and there's eight Zerglings in production already here. Stardust, he could have a little bit of problems on his hands if he's not careful. 12 Zerglings. This is a big push here from Vortex to say, you're not going to get away with that. Yeah. Now we've got 18 Zerglings coming. That's already too much for what Stardust has. But Nexus is going to finish. Oh, more Zerglings. Okay. Yeah, he's, of course, he's seen it with the Overlord. Why would he make anything but Zerglings? Exactly. Speed just finishes as well. They're going to be over there so quickly. What units does he have? He has three sentries. So he's going to get Photon Overcharge. He will have one. He's got his natural world off, so he can Photon Overcharge his third. Wait. But it will probably still die. Yeah. Uh, I don't even think the Photon Overcharge is going to be able to kill off this amount of Zerglings before it will he be has wasted. to do it. Yeah. It's going to be uh -oh. Half-Life as soon as the Nexus finishes. Ah, oh, this is bad for Stardust. Forces Ooh. the cancellation. Very good move here by Vortex reading into the game and tries to push forwards with the Zerglings because why not, you know, see what you can do there, but can't do anything with them just yet. Ten drones in production for Vortex behind this. Can you do this, we asked, with this five minute, <laughs> 15 second third Nexus, and I guess against a vigilant and well-versed opponent, you can't. No, certainly not. The Zerglings going to poke forwards again. Force, at least a force field out oh. there. Oh. oh, those two Zerglings get through as well. And the Overlord's seen pretty much everything. I, he saw the Twilight Council at the front as well. There is a person in our scene who has, uh, who is pretty interesting. Oh, look, this is very Ooh, nice. Oh, that's kills nice. kills a lot of Zerglings. Yeah, very good wraparound there. Killing off all of these Zerglings. It's a, you know, a consolidationary prize for uh, what's actually happened. And the Zergling is getting in to see the Robo as well. So he's seen, again, pretty much everything that his opponent is up to right now. Can Vortex use that information uh, and make sure that he's defended if his opponent's going to go for something? Or try and spot out this third again. Yeah, what, what does he know <laughs> about really what Stardust is doing? Yeah, he saw the Twilight Counter and the Robo. Yeah, you're right. He saw everything, but the Overlord did too. So the Zirkling loss, no matter what, that was a bit of a loss. So he has to reproduce those now, making 24 links again. And if he hadn't lost the links, this third wouldn't be as easy for Stardust. But still, Vortex's drone count looking really, really healthy. Going to be 61 soon. I still don't think he has enough units to actually hold that third. Yeah, probably if the not. Circling, if the Zirklings that he's just produced now run over there, and try and do something against it. Yeah, and also Stardust is warping uh. his stalkers. And I get why he's doing it. He wants to get it going with his blink upgrade, but it's too soon. Like, Zealots will be a lot more useful now. Oh, and the rocks are still not down here, so these Zerglings have a much easier time of actually getting to this third base. They're going to start working on it. He's left, left some Zerglings there to see exactly when his opponent was coming along, oh. but he's going to force the cancellation again. Oh, very nice move now for Vortex. Clappity clap. Clap for Vortex, I would say. <laughs> uh, I mean, there you go. You got you got your response. <laughs> <laughs> that was a pity clap. Anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, that was a really nice move by Vortex, and that's two Nexuses lost. That's hundred. That's twice hundred minerals lost, but much more than that. It's the implied income, and it's yeah. the opportunity cost loss 
for uh, Stardust. Now Stardust is gonna do what? Go into some kind of blink all in? I think so. And because of the position he's in, because this has been set back a little bit here. Ah, uh, it's open. Oh no! Oh, it's all going wrong for Stardust. Vortex separates up the Zerglings as well to do as much damage as possible in the mineral line of the natural and the main. And ah, uh, he has to. He has to go. He has to do something. Wow. But it, Pathogen Glance is just about to finish. If he gets some Infestors out with this as well. Yeah, he can make two Infestors soon. These links are doing so much. Oh, how many workers? He's lost nine workers during all of this. Blink finishes. Plus can two. he do this? He's going to have plus two weapons, and that's it. Tries to warp in some units here, but Vortex is already on top of it. So right now, Stardust maybe could beat Vortex's standing army. Mm. I would say maybe. maybe. With good force fields. He's got five sentries. He's going up against Roaches. There's no Burrow, but there's Infestors coming out. And Galaris, he's attacking the natural. He's oh. attacking the natural, and the main base has a perfect view on think, all those stalkers down there. I think he blinks in and brings the sentries up. Oh, yes. I think he does. Yes. If he goes for this, this could oh. do a lot of damage because now he's sealing off the main. There's not that many roaches there to actually contest this. Picks up the sentries as well, making sure that they're alive. This is a really good move here by Stardust, but at the same time, Vortex is going to be making a very strong army once an engagement comes, if it ever comes. Now, Stardust needs to make cannons at his natural because Vortex, his best bet is going to be a counterattack. But this is a very powerful move from Stardust, and it could look to propel him back into this game. God, what a, what a game we have here in game number two. Vortex going for the full counter-attack, and there's not going to be anything to actually stop that from happening. So he's going to be taking a lot of damage. Full base trade initiated. Stardust trying to There's go for the top the natural. Trying. There's a fight at the natural. There is indeed. That's oh, good fungal on a lot of these stalkers, but at the same time, there's not enough damage for them to constantly chain or even do damage with roaches. How many roaches does he He has only 16 roaches. He's, his army is not that big here for Vortex. He's got 1-1 one, one upgrades on his Zerklings, and he's got 28, 14 more coming, 42 links. Some are dying here, and he's using oh. them bit by bit. He's killing all the sentries down. That's good. That's very, very good. There's not that many stalkers actually left over here. Uh, all of those are going to oh, die. There's wow. a lot more in the main. This actually wrap around with the fungal, killing those off. Vortex is in a very good position right now. Yeah, there was a very crucial Ooh. double fungal growth on those stalkers with the one-one links uh, tearing at them. The dark shrine. The, does he see the dark shrine? Uh, he does see it. He sees it at the back. But does he really do it? It could be a pile on his eye. Did he click on it? These stalkers are still doing some work. And Kalaris, there's only 41 drones left. The lair tech died. There are exactly zero the spore crawlers on the map. The layer tech died. He's not going to have oh any over... He has one overseer. It's out on the field. Oh. But with that many stalkers out on the field as well, if he actually commits to that, it's, it's over the natural. Oh, oh, oh it's God. so far away. And this war prism is right here. It can warp in one DT. One DT. One DT. He has enough gas for one DT. <laughs> and there it goes. There it is. The one DT to rule them all. And the overseers at Stardust Natural. Oh. So it's too far away. Good fungal killing off some more of these stalkers. We still have 15 stalkers out on the field, though. This one uh, overseer, Vortex, does he know about it? Another DT is swiping away at those uh, roaches at the south. Okay, there we go. Two spore crawlers being made. Four spore crawlers oh. being made. Lair started. Could this be a fairy tale comeback from Stardust? Spore crawlers. One DT has a big job of whack a mole to uh, kill all those spores. Yeah, he, he really does. Uh, these roaches kind of be uh, dying off at the front. Um, Okay, we have 29 probes to 30 drones. All the drone roaches are coming back. He has 25 roaches. If he shuts down these Dark Templars, his standing army is so much better than Stardust's. Yeah, but Stardust is re-establishing his natural. He still has a mothership core. If his natural comes up, we're suddenly looking at a two versus two base situation with superior upgrades for Stardust and a superior tech advantage. He's got Blink and DT against just Ling Roach, Vanilla, with no Burrow and Man, Stardust is really finding a way, the best way to stay in this game. And Vortex, what looked like an easy game, he's like, oh, I'm just going to fungle your blink. And, but suddenly... Yeah, this is an ambitious thought, but I wonder if Stardust was like, well, maybe these thirds are going to get cancelled and maybe I have to prepare something behind that because otherwise I have no opportunity to actually kill, his, but kill him. But now he's doing a good job of fighting back. But again, Vortex's army is strong and Overseer's coming out. is going to put a big shutdown on those Dark Templar on the map. I think Stardust is in a small lead here, actually. Mm -hmm. Two versus two base. His natural still has a lot of income. He's making Immortals and Sentries. And well, he doesn't have enough Sentries to hold this attack, maybe. Immortals will be so good. They're he very good one. right now, yeah. Yeah. But uh, Vortex is making Infestation Pit. And he has quite a bit of gas.
He can make some investors. Ooh. 2,200 gas. You're right. He can make 11 investors if he has the minerals for it. If he ends up doing that, those are going to be big, big game changers. Huge game oh changers. Fights with the natural of Stardust at the same time. Ooh, will he be able to get those immortals? He absolutely needs to kill those. One of them is going to be focused down. Photon overcharges here as well to try and help out against these roaches. One immortal does fall, but he loses a lot of roaches in the process. Yeah, he killed that one sentry so that he didn't get locked in there. For that fight, he lost like... 11 roaches. He's yeah. down to 11 now with only 18 lings as well. He absolutely needs this infested infestation pit to finish very quickly. Yeah. Wow. And the worker count is stabilizing. It's 43 for Vortex and 37 for Stardust. That's better for Stardust because uh, two versus two base is usually good for Protoss. Now, Stardust needs sentries as much as Vortex needs investors. I'm wondering though, how easy is it going to be for Stardust to play this out against an opponent that's establishing an extra base? Yeah. But I think it's going to be hard for Stardust to get an extra base yeah. if it continues going longer. Yeah, and, and the thing about these investors, they're only Eleven. 100 minerals each. Yeah. He's got plenty of gas and oh, he oh. just keeps making an investor with every 100 minerals he gets. Fungal is fantastic against Sentry and Stalker, but also he can make infested Terrans. Now, they don't have upgrades anymore like they used to, but still, infested Terrans is a free army which doesn't cost any resources, and that's very important in these low resource situations. Yeah, it really is. And Fungal's going to come along to try and lock down this, and, uh, whoop, well, there we go. Uh, so it does lock that down with some Infested Terrans as well to kill that off. So that's going to shut down a little bit of Stardust's ability to, you know, try and harass and keep his opponent pinned back. Now with this third base going down, Investors are going to be so good. Oh my Eight God. more are on the way. Anytime I looked at the production tab, I saw 10 investors being oh produced. Oh dear. Only now he's running dry of He's going to have 20 investors. Oh my God. He's going to have 20. Do you know how many fungals that is? Do you know how many invested Terrans that is? Uh, that's two, uh, two, uh, two, a lot. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a lot, guys. Yeah. Uh, well, he's going to kill the rocks. That's going to be his defense for now. But those will dissipate very, very quickly as he's setting himself up to go up the ramp at the natural. Wobble, 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 investors coming in. That's uh, a lot of investors, guys. Uh, these force fields need to be really good. At the same time, fungal growth, infested terrans do get lobbed down. This army is going to be locked in place and it is going to die off. It's trying to be sealed in with the infested terrans at the back as well, locking everything down. Zergling is going to town in the natural. And with the army dying off, Vortex takes a massive supply lead. Try to count them, Kalaris. How many infested terrans was it? There's one, two, three, four, five. I, I, no, I lost. Units tab. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Units tab. Perfect. Oh, wow. Vortex. Oh. Going for the 2 0. -oh. 2-0 here against Stardust, killing off this Nexus, and no more units left for Stardust. Vortex is absolutely on the warpath. Infestors saving his bacon here uh, in this second game. <laughs> yeah. wow. GG, guys. Vortex takes a 2-0 lead in this best of five. Could we see another 3-0 clean sweep here in the round of eight? It is possible, Galaris. It's WCS career all over again. <laughs> it's very possible. Wow. That would be such a quick day, so unexpected. Saw all these matchups and thought, wow, each match is going to be really close. But then this happens. Oh my god. Okay, there's no smiles now. Uh -huh. He knows it's game time. Ah, uh, this is a really difficult oh. position for, for Stardust. Now, he has been in this situation before, I do believe. Yes, he has. And he's recovered from it before yes, as well. Exactly. Here are the final moments of game number two between Vortex and Stardust. As this is a guy that beat. Jadon. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> he can he can kill people in the game. He can. Yeah. He, he can kill people in StarCraft 2. You are correct. Yeah. <laughs> now, is he going to go back to <sighs> Forge Fast Expansion? There's so much concern on his face here. So much concern. He does not want to lose this. Not only doesn't want to lose this in general, but certainly doesn't want to lose this on clean sweep. But Vortex right now, he's <laughs> thinking of his family. He's thinking for you know, of his brother Lucifron, who... You know, we got to top eight before, and he got to top eight before, but they haven't been in a top four yet. Do you know what's going through his mind? What is going through his it's mind? It's early pool time. It's er <laughs> Really? <laughs> I think so. I don't know. I think that might be the going through in his mind. I don't know. That would be almost a weak move with how strong he's been playing so far. I, I would agree. But at the same time, he has two games to hand. Yeah, but if you give away one... The momentum swings? Two minus one. Yes. You've got only two games left. We keep doing and this only math one on <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then it's only a bit 2-1, and then if you lose two, you're out. And <laughs> wow. Yeah. And Okay, Vortex, what I'm thinking really right now, is he thinking, yeah, 2-0, it's going well, or is he thinking that game two, 
was more difficult than I anticipated 10 minutes into the game. It that was, was dangerous. Yeah. I gotta be on my toes. How is his mentality? 2-0, that you've got the most crucial mentality things happening. I'm I'm pretty sure in my mind that game number two for Vortex there was all around anticipating some two-base push from his opponent. I'm pretty sure. He always goes to this investor play once he feels that his opponent's going to be going for something like that, especially after seeing the Twilight Council. He loves his investors against Blink Stalkers. Oh, yeah. Absolutely loves them. He did that in the round of 16, shut it down so convincingly uh, on Belshia Vestige. Was it against Wilma? It was. Yeah. yeah, and well, now we have to get into game number three here to see if Vortex can take the 3-0 clean sweep or if we see Stardust bring it back and start recovering from the position he's in. Actually, I think it was Baby Knight. Yeah. Oh yeah, it was Baby Knight. Okay, nice save. Well, I got your back. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, spawning up to the top left-hand corner here of Frost as we have our Red Zerg representing Mouse Sports and Spain. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Mouse Vortex. And spawning down to the bottom right-hand corner are Blue Protoss, representing my insanity as well as Korea. Give it up for Stardust. The pressure is on, Kalaris. It is. It's really on. This is scary. It's right. also on us for making this short day a long day. <laughs> yes, so much pressure. <laughs> we'll just keep casting as the games finish. It's fine. We'll yeah. cast. Uh, we'll cast the menu screen. It'll be fine. So Stardust, once more, with an early gateway. Not doing its Forge Fast expansion. Not saying, man, I'm down 0-2. I'm going to go Immortal all in and cross my fingers. Hmm. What does he have planned this game? Is he going to be more aggressive? We've seen Stargate opening in game one. A very low aggression opening. Like, I'm going to sit back, do a little bit of poking with Phoenixes, kill some drones, but it's really not a heavy hitting type of thing. Not what we're used to from Stardust, who before the 12 minute mark always attacks really, really hard yeah. in all of his games where he has been uh, performing really successfully in tournaments. I'm trying to wrap my mind around what Stardust is going to do here in game number three. He's so up against the wall, so yeah. up against it. And for a DreamHack champion, a constant DreamHack high finisher, every single dream hack he attends, to come into WCS Europe in the round of eight, having tried so hard to qualify for this tournament and go down two games in a best of five. Nerve wracking. Oh, so much. Vortex is a player who has traditionally performed very well in WCS events. Specifically mm. WCS, I don't mean the satellite events. He hasn't gone to necessarily that many of those. 2012, WCS started, Blizzard announced it and a lot of price money was being injected in the scene. And WCS Europe, as we know now, was a great success in that year. And Vortex got second place, finishing behind Stefano. Since that time, I don't think he got a lot of very high top finishes. He got maybe, I think he got a second place at IEM. Vortex, uh, you mean? Yeah. Uh, or third place. The I think he got a second place at the IEM in Germany at uh, uh, the Seabit or the Gamescom. But oh, Cologne. Yeah. Um, I think... That was still in Wings of Liberty, but in yeah. Heart, Heart of the Swarm, he has gotten a top eight at WCS last season. Yes. So for him to go into top four here and go to Canada would be legendary. It would be, it would be huge for him. And his form right now, I mean, look what he's doing. He hasn't dropped a map all season yet. He has not dropped a single map. Yeah. He, so he's currently sits at like 10 map wi wins or something crazy and... Yeah, 10 map wins this season. Yeah. Very impressive. Against zero losses. Now, Stardust. All eyes are going to be on him. Because Vortex, he'll do his thing. If you don't attack him, he'll make drones. If you attack him, he'll make roaches and links. Now, I agree with you, Gwyn Blyde SC2. <laughs> well, I don't agree with that. I'm not a PvZ fan. I'm a big PvZ fan, but that game <laughs> was just amazing, yes. All right, Stardust is changing things up. He's going for four gate pressure. How much of this does Vortex know about? Uh, right now, not a whole lot. He's sending in his overlords, but they're going to be a little bit later uh, to actually spot this. Oh my god, is he going outside? The this is very important to oh, stay outside the vision. Very. And Vortex is relying on overlord scouting. He didn't make third and fourth Zerkling, and his Overlord arrives late. 
Oh, he went through the vision. Uh, he this knows. is crucial time for Vortex to prepare for this. Zergling's already on one way. Spinecrawler goes down at the third base as well. Vortex has an opportunity here to hold this off. Dude, I, I can feel this this series like in the pit of my stomach. I'm yeah. so invested in it. One Spinecrawler coming, <sighs> Zergling's coming. The first gas is coming earlier than usual, a little bit earlier. This is a really close forward pile, and he absolutely needs a lot of Zerglings out. He doesn't have Zergling speed, right? No. The whole time he has not had the gas to go for Zergling speed. Now gases are going down, but this is kind of late. The Roachhorn goes down as well, but this isn't going to be in time to deal with this. I think this is going to be really powerful for Stardust. Yeah. He's got five Zealots on the field, soon four more, and Vortex doesn't have Roaches or speed. So he has to make a lot of slow links, which against Time Warp aren't going to be very good. They really aren't here. Whoa, actually wow. great time warp there, sealing off these queens. They would be very useful against this army if they were able to stay alive, but, well, one does get out there with the help of those circles, but that's so many zealots doing damage, almost killing off the spine crawler. No transfusers available, it goes down so fast. Yeah, more zealots are coming in. The, the queen is going down, which oh. leaves Vortex with just one queen remaining. Army supplies 24 to 15 here. One roach in production. Vortex needs more than that. And right now, he's just, he was lava starved for quite a bit of that. All the injections now just going off here, trying to get those roaches out where he can. But the roaches are already doing a good job over at this third base. There goes the last queen zealots. that Vortex has. No more queens left, and he's got 12 larvae right now. All the injects came. These 12 larvae are gonna have to do it for him. Can he make enough roaches to defend here? Oh. I don't know. There's a lot of stalkers, there's another time warp, there's a lot of zealots. He needs to get all those roaches together as well. He loses two in the attempt to get them all together. And I think he will end up holding his natural, but I, the, the third base is completely forfeit. There's yeah. no way. Yeah, well said. That one is gonna die. And it, it's important to be said here, Stardust actually has more workers than Vortex right now. He has 35 probes yeah. against 32 drones. Equal bases, bigger standing army for Stardust, double what Vortex has. Is there anything that is going in the advantage of Vortex? I don't think so. Not this game. No, he's even supply blocked here, which is going to force a lot of roaches to not be made for a long time. He's got two more on the way, yes, but he's still waiting for those two overlords to finish. Good time warp here, but a nice attempt to try to skirt around it with those roaches, knowing they certainly just couldn't have re uh, retreated directly. Yeah, now those roaches need to stay on creep. Uh, they, they are better micro potential on creep. Another Overlord goes oh. down. Now, only now, Speedling is starting. Vortex overstretched himself, going for three hatcheries without any idea of what the opponent is doing, and paid the price for it. Four gate against no gas. Three hatch is very strong. And a very good follow-up here by Stardust as well, going for the Stargate. And, you know, even if he mixes just in Void Rays from this point on, he knows his opponent's army, uh, sorry, his opponent's economy is crippled. Yeah. Very, very crippled at this point. So affording any transition out of this, even if the Stalkers don't do the job, he has great follow-ups behind it. Yeah, I mean, those uh, Void Rays or even Phoenixes can give him a lot of map control. Very nice micro there with the Stalkers, not losing that many. Uh, actually not losing any yet in that particular case. There goes down one, but he's getting a lot of roaches in exchange. And there you go, GG, oh, guys. Yeah. Stardust is able to take the first map in this series and the first victory of Vortex in WCS Season 3. So that's that's the comeback start for Stardust. That, that is the start is of the it. the start of it. One, two. Taking a short break to rally himself, getting a little bit of important self-confidence here. And Vortex looking at defeat the first time in his whole Season 3 WCS Europe run. Can he handle it? Will he <laughs> play a little bit safer in the next game? Mm. Stardust going to get a drink. And with that, the crowd gives him an applause. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really tough coming back from that 0-2 to take the first map. The road looks so long. You're like, oh my god, I need to win three in a row. But you can't think of that. You got to take it one by one. I feel like that's what Stardust was doing. And now we can go into game four with a little bit lighter heart. Yes. He knows that the road is not as long. Yeah. And that is very, very important. It's not the destination, it's the journey. Oh, <laughs> wow. So deep. So, so deep. deep. He's a little bit he, a little bit more smiles now after that victory because he feels a little bit more confident in himself. Uh, but this is this is so important. Again, both of these players want to keep not only their tournament hopes alive, but that glimmer at the end of the tunnel that is the season finals and then finally BlizzCon. Yeah. Both of these players want it. Everybody wants it. Nobody doesn't want to go to BlizzCon. BlizzCon seems pretty cool. You want to go to BlizzCon? I do want to go to BlizzCon. Yeah, BlizzCon is awesome. BlizzCon's cool. You've been it's to a few, awesome. right? Yeah, I've been to a few. It's very cool. Yeah. So <laughs> that's what they're playing for, guys. BlizzCon, prize money, fame, 
this tournament itself, which is a tournament in and of itself, but it's also a qualifier to much greater portals, the Season 3 Finals and BlizzCon. There's a lot at stake, but all they're thinking about right now, Belcher Vestige, PvZ, Vortex, Stardust, winning. And, of course, in Stardust's case, not losing. That's true, man. That is very true. So let's get into game number four in this best of five to see who advances on to the round of four. Vortex is one map away. Stardust needs to take this map to tie the series up. Let's get into it. As we have spawning down to the bottom right-hand corner, our red Zerg representing Mouse Sports as well as Spain. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Vortex. Spawning up to the top left-hand corner are Blue Protoss, representing my insanity, Korea and Switzerland to a smaller extent. Give it up for Stardust. <laughs> and a change in the wind. Exactly. Tell me about it, Kalaris. Hit me. It's going to be that Forge Fast Expand. Or well, you could go for a Nexus first. Yeah, but it's the same thing. Like, yeah, yeah. It, it's inherent. Like, either you make the Forge or Nexus first, but yeah, it's a Forge fast expense. So, first time in this series that he's doing this. How do you how do you feel about this? To throw it in now, you think? I think it's smart. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he had he dragged out a win, but he knows that game three was like a good build order advantage for him. He didn't scout, so we cannot call it a reaction. We can call it a mind game, hmm. but even then, you can still be wrong about what your opponent is going to do. You can have a really good idea, but it can be wrong. So you could still say he had some luck in the way that worked out, but it's luck that he had control over himself to a, to a degree. Not full control, but he made it happen is what I'm trying to say. I'm yep. not saying he was lucky, but he had some luck. It worked out well, but he knows it wasn't like about the way that he force filled it or the transitions he did. None of that came into play. It was like a good build for the situation. It was well done, but it was just maybe a one-time thing. He can't do that now again because Vortex is going to be playing safer. Now, Stardust went for a very risky, greedy, no scout. Nexus first into Forge. And it's going to work out really well for him because Vortex is doing the very safest build possible with the spawning pool into a hatch. So if all things go normally, and Vortex doesn't throw out a quick curve ball and tries to attack and do a Roach or Ling or Baneling all in, then Stardust is heading into the mid game with a slight economical advantage. And what lends itself really well to that is maybe doing some of that immortal play or quick third play that he has been playing. Yeah, and uh, you know, when we saw him playing um, at DreamHacks and utilizing that Forge play with that 2-1 upgrades, it, it times out so well uh, against what Zergs were doing previously. Now, we haven't seen too much of that style against a player like Vortex. Against a player that doesn't really go for too many upgrades, focuses a lot on units through that mid game. And I'm curious to see how this is going to play up against one another, actually. I actually kind of played it against Vortex you did? last season. Ooh. Uh, the first map that I lost against Vortex in the round of eight, uh, the only map that I lost against him was where I tried to do Stardust style. And of course, oh. I can't do it as well as Stardust. <laughs> so don't put any conclusions on that. Yeah. But it was on Whirlwind, and I did Double Forge. And uh, I attacked, and I couldn't really do much because Vortex scouts well and makes a lot of army. Yeah. Now, Vortex isn't upgrade heavy. We've seen that in this game so far this series. So how does that fare against each other? Very heavy focus on upgrades from Stardust against no upgrades from Vortex. It means that Vortex will have more stuff, mm -hmm. but Stardust makes a lot of sentries. So if he force fields well and can keep away the large part of Vortex's army, it could work out very well for him. Surviving on three base with that would give him a tremendous mid-game advantage and would make any push extremely successful. Cheeky little probe manages to sneak out there as that Zealot did push away that Zergling, but there's going to be another Zergling to intercept. Oh, so good about actually keeping an yeah. eye on that. Very nice circling positioning, I uh, agree there. Now, we see the Robo coming up at 5.30. That's normal Stardust style. That looks like he might be doing his double forge into third play. Mm. And, well, and he always does this too, the Zealot and Probe Scout. Just confirm that there really is a third. Yeah. Have an unlock around, seeing what he can find. Double gas is going down for Vortex behind this. And, uh, well, with that, he can start getting his speed out or even more transitions on. The, the, uh, the Overlord already sees the double gas. Gives him a bit of an indication as to what's going on. He knows it's probably not some mass, mass gateway only exclusive. Yeah. Uh, but aside from that, he's going to spot other things or try to. <laughs> yeah. So, 
Actually, I don't think he's... Oh, wait, it will get there. Yeah, he's making a work uh. This isn't going to be that Double Forge third play. He's making uh, gateways and a warp prism. All right. So I think we might see Kalaris, some sentries in a warp prism, do some token harassment, not too serious, not too committed, and then just make immortals at home and do a 10, 10, 30 uh, immortal push out. So it's a two phase attack. Mm. You try to block the ramp in the main, do some damage, yeah. and yeah. you fly home with the prism, you rejoin with your immortals and you do an all-in. You rejoin, rejoice, and then try for the... <laughs> rejoin, rejoice, yes. <laughs> try for the second attack. Well, the Zergling's on the way, in production here. Uh, the Warp Prism, he knows that... Get in there. <laughs> he knows that particular area how wasn't spotted for a second, but now he's going to fly straight through an Overlord, uh, which is a little bit of a later indication here for Vortex, but he could bring units back. So, another support run. coming out, Observer coming out. And nice reaction from Vortex. Units under the Prism cannot deploy. And there comes an Immortal. And there's, there is extra probes now. He's making extra probes. Is he mm. macroing behind this? Now, there was one Observer already on the way here for Stardust. And, uh, well, I'm under the impression he will change his rally point. And actually warping into the Zealots on the low ground here whilst trying to block in some of those units. All the drones come off the line realizing this is a bit of a scary position with the army trap there. But now that's, that's enough of a cleanup here for Vortex. How many workers okay. did he lose? Seven. Oh, that's, that's quite that's good. That's quite a bit. Yeah. That was that was worth it for Stardust. Now, he stopped at 48 probes. He's making four sentries and an immortal. So I expect to see him adding gateways right now. There we go. Three gateways. Maybe adding a fourth? Not right now. So he's going up to seven with immortals, with 48 probes. And I don't think he's going to be taking a third. Vortex is normally pretty good at holding this off. Yes, exactly. It's his strength, really. Yeah. The 63 drones out, so he still has a pretty good economy, but he did have to replenish a yes. few drones in turn. That's seven less roaches that might be out, or just a few more zerglings that might be out here. Exactly, and he's got to worry about this prism. Does he know exactly what's going to happen? It looks like he does. He's not droning, he's not teching. Mm. But this prism is annoying to him. Well, there's been a zergling on oh, that third yeah. base for the longest of times. So um, unless Stardust is taking the left side yeah, third. which is unlikely. Yeah. <laughs> so Vortex knows what's happening. He does. Supply blocked. Five pylons go down to try and get him out of that supply block. Uh, so yeah. Vortex is supply oh, blocked. Both. Uh, yeah, yeah. And he has five overlords coming out. <laughs> yeah, that, those need to come out as well here. Uh, the armor does start here for Stardust. So there is an attempt to at a transition out of this, but it's going to be very difficult. That's a lot of sentries, though. That is a lot of sentries. So Vortex is going to try and surround this and force out as many of these force fields as he possibly can do. All of those roaches are sealed in with these sentries. He's losing quite a few of them. Roaches coming from the back as well. Force fields go down. Ah, and one of the immortals has to be saved by that war prism. He's got to recall out. He's losing oh. way too much. Vortex with a magnificent hold. This could be the nail in the coffin if Stardust doesn't do something quickly. Look at that army supply, 78 to 29. Vortex knows he's done very, very well in holding that. And, and he... what do you do when your opponent wants to transition to more Immortals and Colossi? Go for that spire. spire, man. Go for that Spire. Stardust lost seven sentries and an Immortal in oh. that attack. Resources lost is more for Sardus than it is for Vortex. Oh my god. When you go for that kind of attack, you do not expect that kind of thing to happen. He's going to focus down that Forge, plus one armor will not finish, and this might just be it for Sardus. His running WCS might be over as those Zerglings continue to plow on forwards with those Roaches as well. There's no army left for Sardus. He pulls the probes knowing he's in a lot of trouble. The Roaches, they're coming in, they're taking down everything. Sentry's going down, the last Immortal defending. He was the best weapon against the Roaches, but their Kryptonite is gone. Only Sentry's left tickling those Roaches and all of this army is sacrificial for Vortex. He's just killing as much as he can, and it's looking like it's way enough. Uh, and that, as much as cleaning up all of the roaches has happened, there's still a lot more roaches on the way, with 17 workers have died off. So now, if Startups wants to pull this back, it's going to be a massive uphill struggle against 69 workers to 33. Oh, 69 workers, and the Spire's already finished. We could see eight Mutalists coming out very, very soon from now. And how do you do a Phoenix transition against Mutilus with literally, well, figuratively, no income? Yeah, it's <laughs> tough. It really is. These two Immortals should be able to hold strong for now. So again, Stardust has a very tall mountain to climb, uh, as Vortex can pretty much do whatever he wants. With these Mutilists coming out, that's, that's his comfort zone, man. That's a lot of Zerg's comfort zone in this yeah. matchup when they find the opportunity to do it. Yes, exactly. 
Exactly. If you can get them and you don't die, you're going to be very comfortable indeed. Yeah. Well said I mean, there. What do you have? He, yes, he's getting blink, but he has currently one stalker. <laughs> uh, not it's that a, useful. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a very acrobatic stalker, really, but he's the all trapeze eyes are artist. Be... <laughs> <laughs> he's going to have to bounce between the main and the natural. He's like a trapeze artist who relies on his partner to catch him, but then there isn't one there and isn't he falls a... down. Like, oh, well, oh. oh he, he gathered a few friends okay. up in the main, so maybe that will help out. Uh, but the mutalists, whoop, they're going to oh. run away. Whoa. There's some acrobatics from our observer, Funka. Seemingly so. And well, that push at the front as well with those roaches killing off the cybernetics core. Oh no. Oh no. No oh. more trapeze artists for Stardust. No, it seems not. The roach, uh, roaches at the front actually trying to hunt down this Colossus with those Zerglings as well. And actually, it's left very, very vulnerable here. Whilst those Mutalists go to town in the main. Good force fields there by Stardust and the Photon Overcharge. To be fair, he's handling this as well as he possibly can do right now. Yes, th those are key words. As well as he possibly can do. But he's in two bases against four. Yes. And I don't want to say Stardust is relishing his last time in this tournament because I don't think this is one of his favorite places to be in. Down less than half supply yeah. than the opponent. But he is just he's just playing out his tournament. Like vic victory for Vortex is almost 100 percent sure. But Stardust just wants to play this out. This is his, probably going to be his last game in the tournament, and he's just giving it what he has, giving it what he's got. And that might just come to a conclusion here as those high mutalists, as well as those roaches, just plow on through once again. And those extra stalkers, even if he just focuses though down, it doesn't matter what he focuses down now because his army is just too big. Stardust is on the verge of going out of this tournament with Vortex going up three to one in this best of five. Such an impressive series from Vortex, playing different style after different style, and there hasn't really been that many upgrades still. A Spaniard in the semi-finals, Vortex GG. wins 3-1. And not only does that guarantee him a round of four place, but that guarantees him a spot at the season final. So congratulations to Vortex here. Moving on. You're going to Canada, Moreno Duran. Are you gonna bring your brother? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe they'll go together. Maybe not. He's a big boy now. He is a big boy. He's made a name for himself in this world. Very, very good player. We always knew he's one of the top Zergs in Europe. And now with the vacancy that Stefano has left, Vortex looks like he could claim himself to be the best yeah. Zerg in Europe right now, perhaps. Very dominant performance here. And of course, Stardust too did very well this season. Has a lot of victories this year. A lot of well played, but right now it's a little bit of a disappointment for him as he is eliminated now. Still has a chance to make it to Canada though. Five players from mm. the Europe region will go to Canada. He needs two consecutive victories tomorrow to be able to qualify for Canada. It's going to be a tall order. This was not Stardust's day. And there we go as he realizes that he has to tap out of this game. And the, the, these are the final moments. Like he wasn't even typing or you know playing. He knew. Um. And there we go. <laughs> There's the cheer from Vortex, knowing that this is a big deal. This is, I think, aside from his second place finish at WCS 2012, uh, WCS Europe, of course. This is his biggest tournament result so far. Yeah, it's really, really big for him. And the story for him is not over. No, he will go up against the winner of MMA Nurture. Yes, I think so. Yeah. That's uh, going to be an interesting one as well. Vortex is looking very, very strong this season. Uh, so we'll see if he can go even further. But for now, we are going to send it over to an interview with Mouse Vortex. All right. Thank you, Calaris and Grubby. I'm standing here with Vortex. You just won three to one. Uh, and I'm going to say it, it was a pretty one-sided series. It seemed like this series was very much so going in your favor, except for one game where uh, you didn't expect the gateway timing. We had talked before, you had said that you weren't completely sure about what we were going to see coming out of Stardust. Mass Phoenix, fast third Nexus. It looks like he was trying to catch you a little bit off guard. Was there a moment that you were worried at all during this series? Yeah, like in every single game, I didn't know what was going on. Like first game, I, I saw, okay, it's just like normal Stargate opener. Then I saw more and more com uh, Phoenix coming. But I, I was a bit lucky that when I saw the Stargate, I was like, okay, I'm just going to mass Roach. But I think it was very good that he went for a second target behind that. And then he did more damage than he should have. And then I just won the game pretty easily. Now, I was actually sitting over there with Apollo talking about your play. And he's seen a, and, and casted a lot of your games. 
it seems that you're kind of known for delaying things like upgrades and instead opting for a lot of the aggression you talked about in your, your interview. Um, I hear you talking about how you were a little bit confused as to what you were seeing, but you kind of stuck to your game plan. Was there ever, were you having doubts about your game plan or was that just something that you went into this tournament thinking, I'm going to do this no matter what? Or did you go into it with a more open mind? No, I had like a very fixed plan in my head for every single map coming into here. I didn't improvise anything. And basically about the upgrade thing, I tend to delay them so much because I think versus the Stargate openers, you can just win it straight away without upgrades. It's kind of a bit uh, risky because if you don't win the game, then you are lost. But yeah, I had like a very clear idea of, I want, of what I wanted to make. Okay, very good. Now, let's talk a little bit you as a player. I know that uh, there's been a lot of uh, talk about whether or not, you know, your commitment, you're either a student or a full-time player. Where do you sit right now, and what does WCS mean to you? Like, is this your tournament for the year, or do you have aspirations of something else? Mm, well, I'm, I don't know if I will go to any other tournament, but um, yeah, WCS is like the most important for me. I have been preparing for weeks just for this. And yeah, I mean, even if I'm a part-time student, right now I'm spending so much time in gaming, much more than I did before. And yeah, it's paying off, it seems. What's your major at, at, at school? Uh, what I'm studying? Uh, computer science. Oh, okay, you don't need to study for that. That's fine. So, uh, the last, yeah, of course. The last question I have for you then is that your next opponent is either going to be MMA or Nurcio. These are two players that I'm guessing you've played a lot against. Um, which one would you rather play against? And who do you fear the most in the tournament if it's not one of those two? I think that uh, at this point it's like a bit. Uh, I think it's stupid to say, I want this player or I want another one. I think everyone here has proven to be really, really good. And sometimes you think you are going to do better versus a player, and then suddenly the one you thought you would win uh, just upsets you. So I don't know. MMA is very, very good. Nurture is very, very good. So I don't really care. I will just try to play my best whoever I get. All right. I really like that. So thanks a lot, Vortex. Good luck in the next round. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to shoot over to the analyst desk. It is now Apollo. Thank you very much. Hello, and thank you in control uh, at the analysis screen. I'm uh, going to have a look at this game. But before we get into this one, I just want to say, first of all, Vortex just had his thumb on Stardust for the entire of the series. Everything he tried stopped. Vortex played this out very smartly. Every single game on top of his scouting. And the one game that he was a little bit slow and late was the game he lost. But everything else immediately stopped. And I want to look at just the last game, just to kind of emphasize how he's trying to pick up wins against Stardust. Once again, before we play, Stardust just came to me right now as he, he went to the bathroom and back and said, ah, this game, because he saw me looking at it and said, this build, I've only used it a couple of times, but I was, I was running out of options. I didn't know what to do against him because nothing was working. So let's now look into this game. So what we end up seeing here is the Warp Prism play to begin with. Double Overlord at the same time from Vortex, the most crucial part as a Zerg player against an aggressive Protoss player is find out what he's doing. That's, that's the most important part. If you can do this, you're in, you're, in, you're in prime position to stop it. So he sends in double overlords. He does see the Chrono Boost into the Cyber Core, which is already kind of hinting towards something, but he doesn't know what. So if we fast forward it, both these overlords, unfortunately, don't get any information. And this just explains how good Vortex is. So he, he doesn't even see the robotics facility, he doesn't know if it's a bunch of gateways, if it's the warp prism or not. But on this right hand side, pause it immediately here. As soon as Vortex sees the warp prism with this one overlord, he is already in prime shape to stop this. So right now all his units are waypointed up north somewhere, and as soon as he sees it, this changes. So if we play from this position, he will waypoint everything to this ramp, protecting it. He knows that a warp in was coming to block the ramp, he's already there, fast. And then what ends up happening is it doesn't work again. He pulls drones to make sure he can push the warp prism away. And from this position, he's already in great shape. He loses all the zealots there. He took a couple of drone losses. But unfortunately, Stardust is already playing from behind because he's meant to do damage, meant to slow down the opponent with that. So Vortex says, all right, if you're playing from behind, let me just drone up a little bit more and prepare for the very standard follow-up from a warp prism attack. If it's not a third, it's going to be an attack. And if I just uh, go over that real fast, as a Protoss player, and you're going for a Warp Prism play, you have two options as the follow-up. You either go for the Immortal Push, or you use the Warp Prism aggressively and take a third. 
But Vortex has a Zergling on the third. He knows it's not going to be a third, so he's already expecting this. And then what ends up happening, splits the units up perfectly at the south and the north. Bit of a mess up with control here. Don't really want to lose the Immortal too fast, which he does. Uh, and everything just kind of falls and crumbles. So he has to recall out and go home. From this position, already defended the Immortal all in. Two attacks, two failures. Spire's thrown down, which is the ultimate insult, because right now he's going to lose a lot on the front door. The gas is going to start to bank itself up. And Vortex, again, just defending against everything. Just perfectly, perfectly well uh, constructed here today. And from this point on, it was an easy victory for Vortex. So congratulations to Vortex moving on as uh, our second semi-finalist. And now, thank you for listening, and it's over to Jeff. All right, thank you, Apollo. We're over here at the uh, social media desk, checking all the submissions to hashtag WCS. Make sure and stay active with that if you're just now joining us. Uh, I'd like to inform you that if you send us some StarCraft II related fan art to that hashtag, WCS, you could be selected to win a Heart of the Swarm Collector's Edition signed by all the players and casters here. Pretty awesome. And we've kept Red Eye far away enough from it that he can't drop it, so that should be cool. I'm here with my son, Kolaris. Kolaris is going to talk a little bit about Rock Hat for us. I am indeed. Um, Rock Hat, obviously, our lovely sponsor here at WCS Season 3. It's a pleasure to have them along for the ride. And they've been doing a few giveaways uh, throughout the season. Uh, we've been uh, giving away some Cone Pure Optical Mice. Uh, but now they're also giving away some more stuff, which is pretty awesome. Uh, so if we can just take a quick look at this. All you have to do is go over to their Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash Rock uh, and then leave a prediction of who you think the winner of the entire tournament is going going to be uh, in the comment below this particular post that you can see on screen now. And then... <laughs> Demaga, <laughs> well, you can win a signed keyboard by Demaga himself. Uh, and I'm sure that we can actually hear it from the horse's mouth himself. So let's hand it over to the lovely Demaga. No. No? No, not this time. I want to show you my mouse, RocketCon Pure Optical. It's designed in Germany in Rocket Studio. All clicks, it's very smooth. Also, you have side button, you can use it in some games. Like for me, I use it for idle workers in StarCraft. We have the best sensor nowadays, ProOptic R3, up to 4000 DPI. If you accelerate it even to 20G, it's still very precise. 